Hey everyone, welcome to the Open Source Legion webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items about the platform before we get started and I hand it off to Ben. Um, you can listen through your computer. Um, you can also listen it through your phone via dial-in, but um, please do note we do have a video that will be playing later on during the webinar and it will only be able to be heard through computer audio. If you have any questions, you can feel free to, um, any technical questions, I should say, um, regarding the platform, please feel free to send them to um, me as uh, an go to webinar and I can help you troubleshoot them. Um, otherwise, I will pass it over to Ben to get started. And um, with that note, I should also say any questions at all that you have, you can also send them to the questions pane. Um, we'll be uh, taking them at the end and I will be sending them over to the team on a rolling basis. So with that, I'll send it over to Ben. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning, taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ben Segrin, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Paratesh Das and Trevor Stanley. Uh, collectively, we're parts of the DGEN modeling team here at NREL. Uh, we're really excited to, uh, to share this webinar with you uh, and, our, and our news about open sourcing the DGEN model. Uh, it's been something that's been in the works for, for several years now. Uh, so we're, we're personally pretty excited to, to see this model uh, released to the public and, and hopefully um, it's useful for other uh, researchers, other uh, consultants, industry, uh, et cetera. So uh, the format of our talk today uh, is we have, a, uh, we have a presentation of about 60 minutes, it might come under a little bit less than that. Uh, and then we've reserved about uh, 30 to 45 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, if you have questions uh, that come up, um, please, as, as Isabel said, please just type them into the chat window and we'll, we'll address them in real time. Um, otherwise, we can collate them for the end. Um, so, with that, um, let's 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 begin. Trevor, next slide, please. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, um, our format today is uh, a bit of overview of what we're doing, uh, different philosophical choices we've made in in designing the code base. Uh, we'll give a, a demo of how to how to use the DGen model and and how to get started um, installing it on your computer, uh, and then. Uh, talk about some of the next steps for development of the model uh, for this year and in the future. Next. Uh, next. Okay. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the DGen model, uh, the DGen model is an uh, NREL design tool. It's now open source. Uh, it's written in the Python programming language, and it also uses um, uh, a SQL database to control data input and output for the for the model. Um, it's primarily used to forecast adoption of cust customer adoption of distributed energy resources. At the moment, our model is able to simulate distributed solar storage and wind. Um, we do have a geothermal module, uh, but it's not being open sourced at this time. So it. Uh, one of the aspects of DGEN that makes it unique uh, is it's highly spatially resolved. So um, it inherently produces forecasts uh, at the county level, uh, county sector level um, through 2050. Um, it's also uh, formulated as what's called an agent-based model. So as opposed to top-down models, uh, DGEN is, is much more of a bottoms-up model where we simulate uh, different agents, which are uh, intended to represent clusters of consumers, uh, how they make decisions to adopt DERs or not, what attributes uh, they have, how they how they all play out uh, into the decision to adopt DERs or not. And, and as I mentioned, um, it also incorporates detailed spatial data uh, to instantiate the agent attributes, uh, both things like uh, their solar generation potential, as well as what retail electricity structure they're on, what incentives might apply to them, um, how many households are in a given uh, area, et cetera. And so this schematic here on the right shows um, conceptually how we sample the agents for the model. And we use an approach that we, we informally call the pin drop method. So we collect a variety of uh, GIS spatial layers um, and then sample agent locations that are weighted by population density, intersecting uh, the data for each of these locations. Some attributes can't be determined spatially, and for those we use uh, different statistical uh, probability distributions, sample from those to assign attributes to the agents. Uh, we'll talk about some of this more later on. Um, so so one, one sort of 
caveat, I guess, is that um, DGEN at the moment uh, is not capable of simulating individual households, any arbitrary individual household in the US. Um, so for example, many, many users do like to use DGEN for distribution system planning uh, to specific feeders, substations, what have you. Um, and so that, that's certainly a capability of the model, but is not, um, that data is not public at this point because it, it tends to be proprietary or, or uh, confidential in nature. So um, we'll talk more about that later on. Uh, thank you, next slide. So uh, a little bit of a soapbox here. Why, why have we open sourced the model? Uh, you know, broadly, this is mirroring a, a broader trend at the Department of Energy uh, to make uh, publicly funded tools accessible to the public, uh, to make both the code and the methods um, accessible. Um, but also uh, our, our goals as a team are to, to improve the collaboration that we have with the user community and hopefully that we hope that the user community is able to um, interpret the methods, the data that we have and, and build on that and, and provide feedback on how we can improve and, and better serve the public. So um, it's more transparent, it's more flexible, uh, and it, it allows better collaboration between NREL researchers and the public. Next slide. Um, DGEN is licensed under what's called a BSD3 uh, license. Um, BSD3, uh, you can see some of the summaries here of, of what's allowed. It's generally speaking, one of the most permissive software licenses out there. Um, so, so speaking broadly, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, it, it does allow uh, users to, uh, to use it without, um, without, with, with hardly any restrictions, frankly. Uh, so uh, consultants, private, private industry uh, are able to use it. You are able to adapt it for your own needs uh, and then use it, um, say for clients. Um, you're also, yeah, you're able to adapt it and create private versions of the repo. Um, and uh, one of the caveats there is, uh, the BSD3 license does need to persist with any future changes to the model. So it, once it's licensed under BSD3, it uh, needs to persist as a BSD3 license software. So if you have any questions about that, um, legally what, what you're allowed to do or not, um, first of all, we have the link here to the full text of the license. Uh, and if you have further questions after that, um, please, please contact us and we'll connect you with um, NREL's legal counsel. Thank you, next slide. Um, okay, so DGEN, uh, just to get, give a kind of really high level overview of how it's architect, architected. Um, so, so I mentioned earlier that uh, DGEN is, is designed such that the code is separated from the data and the data is specifically housed in a, a post, PostgreSQL database. So um, <clears throat> there are essentially three types of um, uh, tables, files that we're using in our database. Um, so we have a generically a database of, of different input files. Um, also for every DGEN run, there are a set of agents that are, that are used for that run. Um, those could be say agents for the state of California um, or for the nation or for an ISO. Uh, we also have load profiles as a separate table. Um, these are synthetic uh, load profiles uh, that are simulated by NREL. Um, so input data plus the scenario that you're running itself. And these are designed in the um, input scenario subfolders and the input data subfolders. Uh, Trevor will speak to that more. Um, uh, so the, the code is housed here at, at GitHub. Uh, thinking about it as a pseudo code. Um, so essentially we're, we would loop over for each year, sorry, for each scenario, for each year and for each agent. Uh, first, the agents update their uh, attributes you know, given that costs are declining or rate structures are changing, uh, then they calculate their technical potential. Uh, next, they calculate uh, what would be the optimal DR system configuration for them, such that it maximizes their net present value. Uh, given the optimal system configuration, next they calculate various economic metrics. Um, one example would be how much bill savings they would see from adopting DR. Others would be the payback period or net present value. Uh, and then finally, they simulate how much adoption occurs in that in that year. Uh, once the scenarios are completed, um, outputs are are again um, ingested to the to the database, uh, and these are housed in a in a table called agent outputs. It's one of the key uh, output files of of the model. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, talked a lot about agents. So DGEN agents are statistical in nature. So that means that they're intended to statistically represent the underlying population. Our agents at the moment do not represent um, individual households or businesses. Each agent has a weighting factor, a statistical weighting factor that should be interpreted as um, representing N identical customers where N is their statistical weight. Um, they're primarily um, segmented by sector and county. Within the county, uh, there are multiple agents uh, based on the county's population. Um, and as I said earlier, each agent's location is, is um, uh, is sampled based on population density um, and is, is identifiable as a centroid of a given census block. So um, you know, conceptually, more populated counties have more have more agents uh, to better represent the, the heterogeneity in the population. Uh, one of the new factors here in our open source model is we have paired with NREL's um, buildings, buildings technology office team. Um, so specifically, we're using NREL's ResStock and Comstock tools which uh, use NREL's Open Studio software to simulate whole building energy consumption. And so from these, we derive our uh, synthetic load profiles for each agent. So um, these are calibrated against uh, recorded energy use uh, as well as um, sampled such that they are both comprehensive of the underlying uh, energy consumption as well as representative of the heterogeneity or the variance um, household to household that you see. In electricity consumption, you know, one household may have a swimming pool, another might uh, be natural gas heated or electricity uh, fueled heated, et cetera. Next slide. So um, one of the one of the ways that we are trying to enable uh, easier user access is by pre-generating as much of the data as we can, um, because because not pre-generating, generating the data on the fly is quite computationally intensive. So um, first of all, the the model data and code are intentionally separated from each other based on um, you know software best practices. The data for the DGen model is currently hosted on. NREL's uh, Open Energy Data Initiative or OD website. There's a there's a link on the bottom right of this slide. Um, and um, so for ease of use, uh, model data has been prepared uh, as, as pre-generated agents and DGEN databases for each US state and each US ISO RTO. So um, you, we do have a national agent database, uh, but we also have a database, again, for each unique state and ISO. Um, one of the things that users should be aware of is that running the DGEN model can require substantial computing resources. So for example, uh, currently our full US uh, database or our model has nearly 350,000 agents uh, that are simulated. And that, that takes us uh, here at NREL over 24 hours per scenario to simulate. So that, that's, that, that may be a computational burden um, that exceeds your own access to, to resources. So, the computational time is directly correlated to the number of, of agents simulated. So fewer agents means a faster run, but also a less precise um, simulation. So we, we strongly recommend that new model users consider uh, starting small. Um, we don't recommend that you run the national database at the moment uh, as a first step. So, uh, and, and that, that may not even be required for, for different use cases, but we do recommend you start small with uh, single state simulations where that's applicable. Uh, so for example, four states in our, in our database, um, Washington DC, Delaware, uh, North Dakota and Vermont all have fewer than 100,000, sorry, 1,000 agents within them. Um, and so those, those size of files should easily run on most uh, standard laptops today. Um, and we're, we're also working right now on releasing what we're calling our mini national database. So I'm trying to slim down from 350,000 agents to something uh, much more modest that will run on more modest uh, computing uh, requirements. Um, if you have any questions about that, uh, we're happy to address those or we can just discuss those more in the, the Q&A section. Next slide. Okay, um, so how have we designed the software for the release? Um, in general, we try to take as much of a modular approach as we can uh, because we feel that's important for users that may not want the full functionality of the model. They may want um, access to different parts of, of what the model can simulate. 
uh, first thing that we've done is um, we have designed the model to run within a Docker container. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not able to elaborate too much on what containers are, but they're a type of uh, emulation where you have a, a sort of self-enclosed software that, that can run um, and, and simplify uh, the, the technical specifications of running it. Um, so th this allows us to um, to simulate, sorry, not to simulate, but to um, uh, to configure a SQL database within the Docker container. So you don't need to set up your own uh, SQL um, server, your own SQL database. Um, you, if, as long as you can run the Docker container, mount the Docker container, um, that then you can run the, the database within that container. Um, yeah, if you ben, just to uh, yeah. elaborate a little more on the container, it's it's kind of like a virtual machine, so it's just self-contained, and uh, the idea is that it allows a user to just set it up uh, easily, irrespective of your operating system, and and kind of port it over, so you could uh, easily transfer it to another uh, thing like the cloud, for instance, or um, another computer. So it just makes it a little more simple. Uh, because we don't know what kind of operating machines uh, or systems you all are on. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Trevor. Well, well said. Um, so some of some of the other tools that we're using here are uh, the Anaconda, uh, which is a, a, a type of um, Python environment, I guess you'd say. Uh, it's 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 meant to uh, simplify um, library and package management, as well as uh, be able to create a consistent environment that that has all of the necessary. Um, software libraries that DGen uses. Um, it also has a very useful um, uh, development environment. Um, we're also using GitHub, uh, which hopefully people are aware of GitHub at this point, but this is um, sort of a software best practice for uh, being able to, um, to, to, uh, to copy the software, to clone it, uh, to create your own branches, uh, to, to manage version control, submitting any tickets for any bugs that people find in the code. Um, and so on. Next slide, please. Okay, next Next, we'll talk about uh, what's happened specifically for the open source. Um, so one of the, the biggest updates in the model uh, is that we've now completed the pairing of DGen with NREL's uh, system advisory model or the SAM model. And specifically, we're using what's called PySAM, which is um, the SAM model's Python API. Um, so what that what that means in more simple language is that when you run DGen, all of the economic calculations are actually being run within the SAM model, and so that's enabled us to um, add the capability of model solar plus storage, which which the SAM model uh, can can simulate. Uh, we've also updated from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, that allows us to have access to more uh, modern software libraries. Um, the code you know runs better, runs faster. That sort of thing. Um, uh, model calibration. This is another task in our project overall. Um, so we're working on automating, uh, creating a process to automate the calibration of the model uh, using historic adoption of DERs. And that is not currently available uh, in the public model, but will be launched uh, sometime next month. Next slide. Uh, speaking more about PySAM. Um, so again. Basically, anything that the SAM model can do, um, now the DGEM model can call that, that capability. Uh, so this essentially allows enhanced modeling of DR performance and financials, uh, optimization of, of, of how uh, different combinations of solar, uh, sorry, different combinations of solar storage system configurations uh, would, would result in different economic outcomes, um, allowing the user to uh, set different, for example, storage, um, dispatch heuristics and um, whether they want to um, dispatch it to maximize revenue or to maximize the amount of peak that's shaved. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it speeds up certain functions within the model itself. Um, uh, and, and in general, uh, allows the user to simulate multiple new technologies and access the, all the different financial modules that are within SAM. Next slide. Um, Another change that we've made, as I mentioned earlier, is our databases are now partitioned uh, at the state, ISO, and national level. Um, so this running, as I mentioned, running uh, a smaller file, like say a small state, uh, will run much faster than running the full model, which may not be needed for all users. Um, we've also integrated the low profiles directly into the database, so it's not downloaded as a separate file. 
um, and just done some general housekeeping on, on the data organization within, within the database. Next slide. Okay, next I will uh, give the baton to my colleague Trevor, uh, who will give us um, a demo of, of how to use how to use DGEN. And just as a note, uh, if you are connecting over your phone, the audio for the video will not work. So if if you, I, I recommend that if you're on your phone uh, and you have the capability, uh, please try to connect uh, via the the, the VoIP. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll share the recording of this afterwards. Thanks, Trevor. The floor is yours. Great, thanks Ben. Yeah, and like Ben said, we will uh, put this demo video in the uh, data submission and also make the recording of the, the webinar and the overall demo video available uh, as a shareable link on GitHub. So with that, we'll start this. Hello, I'm Trevor, and I'll be walking through a brief tutorial of how to set up and run the open-sourced GGen model. This tutorial is targeted at users who have some basic experience using Python and SQL. You'll be able to set up and run the model locally with the tools showcased and the resources provided. Today, I'll be going over how to access the data, how to set up the tools and workflow for the model. Then I will demonstrate a model run and finally, go over how to visualize and access the results of a model run. To begin, we must download the data. By navigating to the DGEN open source repository and scrolling down to the data section, we can go to this link, which will bring us to the DGEN submission on the Open Energy Data Lake Initiative. By navigating to the Model Inputs tab, we can see all of the different data, base files, and accompanying data needed to run the DGEN model. The submission includes databases at the state level, at the ISO level, and at the national level. The national level database can be found at the end of the submission. Note, this file, when unzipped, is approximately 60 gigabytes. So if you're running a national level scenario and downloading this database, please make sure to allocate the proper amount of space on your computer. This submission also includes the agents needed to run the DGEN model. This zipped agents folder contains all of the different commercial and residential agents for the different state, ISO, and national scenarios that I mentioned. You can also access individual agent files in these folders. So if I go into the Wyoming folder, this database has the specific load profiles and other data that is specific to Wyoming. And then we can see the residential and commercial agent files are included in here. So this is the best option to just download these individually if you want to only run a specific version of the model. Uh, but if you want to run the national version of the model, you'll need to download this and unzip it. The submission also includes metadata associated with the agents. This contains all of the load data and other relevant building characteristics for those different agent scenarios that I mentioned. Unlike in the beta version of the model, the load data contained within this folder is no longer needed to be downloaded as this load data is incorporated into the various partition database files. So users will no longer have to specify the load data or download any of this data. But if you are interested, there is a lot of relevant data uh, that could be used for other purposes uh, or adapted for a specific need that your organization might have. Next, there is a DGEN variable input output key. This provides basic descriptions of the input and output variables. There is also a 
county FIPS to DGEN county mapping file. So the DGEN model has specific county IDs that differ from the county state FIPS codes. So this will be needed to convert the DGEN county IDs to their respective county FIPS codes and DGEN names. For more information about the data, we can go back to the repository, go to the wiki at the top, and then click open source data to find more information. Fork the repository by coming up to the right hand corner and clicking fork, and then following the instructions. This is a simple process and I will not show it here since I have already forked the repository. Once it is forked to your private GitHub repository, you will then come up to code and you can click this to copy the URL to your clipboard or simply highlight this and click copy so that you can clone it to your local machine. Now we can clone the DGEN repo to our local ma machine by navigating to the folder we want to clone the repo into and typing git clone and then paste the link that we copied earlier, enter. You can see here it is cloning the repository. If you have not already set up your git account uh, and configured it in your terminal, you may need to do that or simply enter your username and password while trying to run this in command line. You can see here that the repository is being cloned. We'll need to finish before we can open it. Now that the repository is cloned onto our local machine, you can open it up and you'll see a file structure like this. The next step is to set up our Anaconda environment that contains packages with specific versions configured to run the model. To do this, we will navigate to the Python folder within our repository. Within this folder, there is a specific uh, .yaml file named dgen here. By typing conda environment create f dgen.yaml and clicking enter, we will create an anaconda environment. Since I've already created mine, I'm getting an error saying it already exists. However, Upon creating a new environment, it should ask you if you want to proceed, and you will just say yes and wait for the environment to build. After the environment is built, you can simply type conda activate dgen to activate the environment. Your terminal should change like this. Once activated, Simply type spider, spider to launch our integrated development environment. This can take some time to load. Simply wait for this to load. You will see after spider launches an environment like this. Right now, the dgen underscore model.py file, which is the main model file, is open and the console is ready to take Python commands. The next step in setup is to create our Docker container that will host the Postgres database. Going back to the GitHub repository, we 
we will scroll down and copy this command. Then going to terminal and making sure that Docker is already running. We will paste this command and simply click enter. I will not showcase this here as I've already built this container. Just note that pulling all of the relevant information can take some time to do. Once this is completed, you will get a digest number, a status number, and an additional alphanumeric number. You will next want to simply type docker container ls and you can see that your container has been built. It will have a unique container ID. It'll have the image that we built the container from and it will be on the ports that we specified. You do not see this when you type docker container ls. It is likely because the container has not actually been started yet. You will need to type docker start and then the container ID. To restart the container. We will next enter into the container once it is started by typing docker exec it the container ID psql u postgres. This connects us to the postgres database server running on our docker container by typing backslash L, we can see the initialized databases on our server. I have already created and backed up the database that we will be using to run the DGEN model. However, you will not see DGEN underscore DB upon completing this step. You must type create database and then the name of your database. Followed by a semicolon. Upon clicking enter, it'll say create database. And you can confirm that it was created by saying backslash L. And see here that test database one has been created. Next, we will open a new terminal and copy this command on the GitHub repository. Back in terminal, we'll paste this command and edit it. Importantly, you must edit the container ID here with the unique container ID that was created when you created your container. And you must edit the path that you saved the database file and making sure that that database file has been unzipped. This is unique to your file system. For Mac, you will have something like backslash users slash username. For Windows, this will be slightly different. Just make sure that you know the path to this backed up database file and click enter. Since I have already backed up this database file to the database that we created earlier, I will not demonstrate this, especially as this can take quite a while. 
since the database file is large, please be patient as this can take sometimes up to an hour to restore the database. After the database has finished being restored, we will launch PG Admin and add the server by clicking Servers, Create Server. Here, we can name the server whatever we want. I have decided to name mine Docker, as seen down here. Importantly, we must go over to the Connections tab and type 127.0.0.1 as our hostname slash address. We could also type localhost here if the previous address gives you issues for some reason. In some instances, localhost is actually sent as, set as simply 0.0.0.0. .0. So specifying localhost will help default to the actual address that your computer is using. The port should be 5432. Next, username is Postgres. Password should also be Postgres. You can simply copy and paste that here or type it. Then click Save. Once added, we'll see the server here to the left. When we expand this, we can see the database that we added earlier containing seven different schemas. The diffusion load profile schema contains the commercial and residential load profiles corresponding to the agents for this particular database, whether that be at the state level, ISO level, or national level. The other schemas contain important information needed to run the model. Importantly, the diffusion template schema contains several different tables that will be copied each time a new model run is performed. Agent outputs will be the final location for outputs from a model run. Now that we're connected to the database, we'll go back to the repository on our local machine. I've expanded the Excel folder under the dgen underscore os folder. This Excel folder contains an Excel sheet used to specify different parameters for the model. Double click this to open and say yes to enabling macros. The input sheet is a simple way for the user to configure the model. Here we can see the technology selected is solar plus storage. Wind will be added at some point, as well as the ability to simply run solar without storage. The agent file has been pre-populated as residential Delaware scenario. This is the name of one of the agent files that you would have downloaded earlier. Important to note, here is that the .pkl or .pickle file extension is not needed here. So just the name of the agent file will be inputted in this location. Region to analyze should match the agent file that you specified here. So in this case, this is Delaware, but we can see we have the ISOs as options, the United States as an option, and then all of the different states. Alaska and Hawaii are excluded from this analysis. Next, we can select our market to analyze. So in this case, it will be residential, but commercial is also an option. Then we can specify the end year of our analysis. So currently I have this set as 2030. So the model will run until 2030 and model 2030 and stop. Uh, but this goes all the way up to 2050. The next few rows are simply specifying different inputs for things like our load growth scenario, retail electricity price escalation, 
and various other important inputs. Some of these correspond to files or tab tables rather in the database, whereas others are specific files within uh, the repository. So these can be altered in both locations. If you, for instance, want to uh, create a scenario with um, higher retail electricity prices for your particular region uh, or what have you. Once this is configured how you like, you can simply click File, Save, and importantly, you will save this file in the Input Scenarios folder. Here I've already saved it, and you can see that this squiggly uh, dollar sign with the faded uh, file name simply means that the file is open right now. Uh, and this is just a, a way I've uh, configured my Mac to show hidden files. Uh, so that can be ignored for most people. But the important thing is to save this not under the Excel folder once configured, but to save it in the input scenarios folder, which should be empty upon cloning the repository to your local machine. Now that we've set up the database, we must configure the model so that it can connect with it. In Spider, our integrated development environment that we set up earlier, we'll come to the left-hand corner to this white envelope symbol and open a new file by navigating to where we saved our repository and go to the Python folder to open pgparamsatlas.json. We can see that it is configured to connect with our database in a similar way as we did with pgadmin. The database name is dgen underscore db. The host is set as the local host. Port number is 5432 and username and password are both Postgres. Now that the model knows how to connect with the database, we can come back to just the dgen underscore model.py file within our spider IDE and simply click the green arrow button to run this file. You can see here that the different configurations are printed from the input sheet. We will also get several info and logger warning messages printed out with each year of the model that is run. You can simply ignore these. It has moved on from 2014 to 2016 and will continue for however long we've specified, which in this case is until 2030. Running the model can take some time. For the residential scenario we just did for Delaware, it took about 208 seconds. However, the commercial scenario for Delaware will take substantially longer as there are significantly more agents to run. This is true for other states and especially for the ISO and national level runs that one might do as there are many agents and counties to run. We recommend trying to use alternative compute resources such as AWS or a dedicated server that your organization might have. The DGEN team is working on creating a Docker image that can be mounted on different cloud provider services such as AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud uh, services. However, the user would need to bear the brunt of this cost, and this is still in development. Finally, when the model run has completed, you will see at the bottom this warning with the name of the output schema that was created. This will have the date of the model run and the time of the run in military time 
down to several milliseconds. We can find this specific schema in the database by refreshing your server once you've navigated back to pgadmin. Here we can see in the dgen database, our new schema from our model run has been added. We can expand this and go to tables and then to agent outputs and scroll down to the tab view slash edit data and click first 100 rows to briefly observe the data. and results of a model run. I will go over how to visualize and query this data in a Jupyter notebook, but before I do, I'll briefly just show how you can export this data as a CSV if that is your preferred method of storing and analyzing the data by clicking on agent outputs and going down to the import slash export tab and clicking on that. To bring up this window, we'll wanna make sure that this is set as export. We can name this agent outputs Delaware res. CSV and make sure our format is CSV or perhaps text if that's what you prefer and change the coding if you'd like. Importantly, we'll want to change the header option to yes so that the names of these columns is passed on and change the delimiter to a comma. Finally, we can just hit OK and we can see here that the job was created and successfully completed and downloaded to our local machine. Querying data and visualizing this data in a Jupyter notebook is fairly simple to do. And we've provided a simple notebook to do this called Visualizing DGen Results. We'll first import various packages needed to visualize the results by simply clicking shift enter on these cells. In this cell, we'll connect to the database and then specify the specific schemas within the database that we're wanting to grab. Here I've run a residential and a commercial run for Delaware. We can query various data from the agent outputs table associated with the schemas above. Here I have a residential and a commercial query. And I'm simply creating data frames from these. I can then combine these data frames in the next cell to produce a table of the relevant data that we're wanting to visualize. You can see here some of the relevant fields are deployment in terms of megawatts, the total developable roof area and square feet, payback period, and average per year, the system size, the load associated with each year of the model, the generation, the cumulative generation, and then of course other data such as the year and sector and our scenario, so residential and commercial. To briefly summarize this data, we can run this next cell and get a general sense of how our data differs in the residential versus the commercial scenario for Delaware. Below, we can observe the tables with specific data and compare them side by side. And then lastly, create basic matplotlib charts of the data.
So here I have simply plotted deployment, system size, and payback period. Jupyter Notebooks is a great way to uh, play with this data and pr produce some quick visualizations. Uh, but as I showed earlier with exporting the agent outputs table as a CSV file, you could also create these visualizations in Excel if you uh, prefer that method. The GGen team also developed a web application to visualize pre-generated scenarios. So the link for this can be found on the README and also the DGen website. Once we've configured this how we like, we can hide this and view the results. Here we can see that deployment in megawatts is being displayed for every single county in the United States. We can adjust the time slider to view how deployment might change in a given year. We can also drill down and look at different regions. So we can change this to state and see aggregate deployment for that state. We can go back to counties or look at the specific ISO and RTO regions if we highlight one of these regions, so ERCOT in this case, we can scroll down and see the deployment over time in megawatts for this specific territory. We can do this at the state resolution as well as the specific county. and continue to change what we're looking at. This concludes the DGen demo video tutorial. For more information, you can refer to the README on the DGen GitHub, as well as the wiki which has useful information about the data, the input sheet, and contribution policies to the code base. You can also email us at dgen at nrel.gov with any questions, comments, or feedback that you might have. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that was the demo, and I just wanted to briefly touch on the web application. So uh, right now we only have one scenario in the, uh, that's loaded into the database that this web application is drawing upon, and we we do intend to release more uh, going forward. But this is really just to provide uh, you know a set of standard scenarios that. Uh, users might be interested in and uh, don't have to compute on their own. So this web application uh, is in no way linked to a individual model run that you might do on your local machine. It, uh, it really is just to visualize results that we've pre-computed uh, and, and used you know, our, our high performance computing uh, computer to do. Uh, so there's a lot of scenarios like that that we'll release uh, going forward, but for now, it, it's just a useful tool for you guys to do different you know, scenario building and, and kind of quickly visualize the results uh, at different geographic resolutions. Cool, so. Um, and then there are several more slides in this PowerPoint that are reference slides. So uh, all this information is on the GitHub as well. Uh, in the README and the wiki page, but these uh, slides are here for reference uh, and kind of break down the steps that I went through in the demo video in a little more detail. Uh, so if you would like to go back through these and reference them, you can do that. With that, I'll hand it over to Paratosh.
Thanks, Trevor, for the detailed step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, I would just add that, like, please have uh, patience with the installation process because it might be a little tricky. So there are, as Trevor mentioned, there are various avenues to follow that process. Uh, on the GitHub Wiki page, we have detailed instructions to go through that. We would be also posting this uh, webinar. So you would uh, have reference, you, you can follow along the video that Trevor showcased earlier and like pause it and perform the same step on your local computer and, and, and have the same result. Uh, next slide, please. So let's let's so we now have an understanding about how to set up the model and what are the capabilities that it has as it exists today. So what are the future exciting stuff that we are planning in 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 the in the future? A couple of steps that come out for us that's important on the development side is that that was mentioned earlier about integrating the new calibration module within the open source version. As Ben mentioned earlier, the calibration module basically is an automated process to calibrate the agent decision-making process using historical data. So we have collected a lot of historical adoption data from the whole of US, which is a driving data set to, to calibrate the model for, for agents to make the decisions. That's a key module that we think would add a lot of value to it. So keep an eye out for it. We are planning to release it uh, sometime in November. Uh, the second one, I think Trevor also mentioned about this uh, in his uh, presentation earlier. We are trying to use or uh, leverage a lot of cloud computing resources uh, to mitigate the the run runtime problems that we might see running a large scenario. If it's 24 hours for a whole US scenario, we want to mitigate that to like as much reasonable amount of time as we can. We are also working on formalizing the documentation. You would see a lot of documentation already on the GitHub Wiki page, but we are trying to put it as, as closely as together. And we want to add a lot of other feedback that we get. Um, I think Paradaj might have uh, cut out, but uh, just to continue out where he left off. So we are going to formalize the documentation uh, into doc strings. Many of the functions uh, within different modules in DGen have documentation in doc string format, but uh, some are incomplete or just need to be updated and, and we want a more comprehensive uh, documentation scheme. So. That will be forthcoming um, and there are also forthcoming um, technical reports that we're working on that uh, are, are being closed out and um, going through review processes so uh, we are not sure when those will be released but those are uh, uh, in in the works right now um, and then lastly we do have uh, technical support so we have some funding to provide different organizations uh, with, with technical support to set up and use the model to adopt it in different ways and uh, uh, potentially you know, maybe create some additional modules that users might find uh, helpful. So I think Ben could probably expand more on that. Um, we've had some conversations with different companies and um, organizations, uh, both public and private, uh, about that so far. Please let us know if, if you're interested in that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Trevor. Um, yes, if you if you are interested in using the DJ model uh, and need some support, um, either to get started or to do something more advanced, please please reach out to us and we'll do the best we can to support you. Uh, we we really want to grow the user community uh, and make sure that this is a, a tool that's useful for uh, for people that want to use it. Um, and also, as it says here, uh, we will be eventually migrating to an annual cycle for model versioning and, and data versioning. Um, for the first year uh, of the project up until 
um, let's say um, September 2021, uh, that, that might be a little more ad hoc. It might be a quarterly release or biannual release schedule. We're tr still trying to figure that out. Uh, but we do eventually hope to, to get to a point where we can provide a stable model version and a stable um, data for, for, our, for our users. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, we're looking for you. Uh, if you're interested in DGEN, um, we, we really wanna hear from you uh, in every aspect of how you're using it. Uh, we'd love to hear if you found any bugs that exist in the code, um, if you have any suggestions for how we can make the model more usable. Uh, maybe selfishly, uh, please recommend colleagues to join our mailing list. That's one of the best things you can do to support us so we can grow our reach and make sure that we're yeah, reaching our target audience. Um, and we just like to know how people are using DGEN. Um, if there's some report that's used it, um, uh, student dissertation, what have you, um, please let us know. We would love to hear about that. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we are trying to uh, grow our developer community. So uh, if you are interested in kind of going to the next level um, and, and are interested in contributing code or data to the open source tool, uh, please contact us. We really want to hear from you. Um, we also are able to accept what are called pull requests. So if you have uh, found a bug and are able to fix it, uh, you can submit a pull request. Um, it doesn't have to be a bug, it could be any kind of feature. Um, you can submit a pull request and we have, a, we have the method, uh, the steps there on, on, on how we'd like you to submit um, your, your pull request. Um, again, we can provide technical assistance and training on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that's pretty liberal right now, so uh, please do reach out if, if, you're, if you're interested. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, we have now entered, exited the, the, the webinar and we're happy to take any questions or any kind of discussion that uh, people have, uh, have for us. So, um, yeah, Isabel, I don't know if there's been any questions submitted so far, uh, or otherwise, um, please submit them to the, the chat window. Okay, uh, there have been a couple of questions coming in. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to um, start with some of my own. Uh, Paratash, what, what do you think is the most exciting capability of DGEN that maybe people aren't aware of? Thanks, Ben, for the question. Sorry, I had some technical issues going for in the earlier section and my internet completely dropped. But I think something that I'm really interested in or looking forward to it is like the web application that Trevor mentioned. I think that's a key part of, of this analysis that people don't have to go and like run code on their computer, have to be super geeky and run all the different steps. But if they're just interested in results that, that are already pre-processed and already there and might be relevant for their particular ISO or RTOs or a particular county or a particular city, and the results are already there on the web app viewer. And we would be updating those uh, next year or with as analysis comes out, new analysis comes out with new data sets. So if if that's the level of usage that you feel that would be super helpful to you, I think please uh, use uh, that web app application platform. You can download uh, different results at different granularity, county level, state level, the whole of US for different scenarios. And if you have like suggestions about a particular uh, scenario that you or your team is more interested in, we please get the questions in at dgen.nl.gov and we would try to incorporate that in our next set of data releases on the web app viewer. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come up uh, is, um, Trevor, this one is for you. Um, if someone does want to set up their own database uh, server to bypass the, the container. Could you could you talk about what that process would look like? Yeah, so that would really entail just setting up a Postgres server on your local machine. Um, and that's that's fairly simple to do uh, since that's an open source software, you can usually just download that. And I think with Max, uh, that's pretty easy to do with just like a brew install Postgres 
Um, I'm not exactly sure how that looks on Windows. There's probably a Postgres installer that you could use. Uh, and, and like Ben said, that's uh, an alternative to the Docker container. Um, the one ca caveat there is that there are sometimes specific modules like PostGIS uh, that are, are needed um, for the, the database to work correctly. Uh, and also the version for that can sometimes cause issues. So if it's too old a version or maybe too new of a version, uh, I can't quite remember the version that we have uh, uh, have this running on um, and I can follow up with that and, and make sure to include that in the documentation. Um, but that, that could be potentially an issue if you're using too old of a version, I'd say. So, um, you know, that's, Something that you could check if you set up the, the Docker container and you um, it, it's working correctly, then you could just copy that version and, and any modules like PostGIS into a, uh, a your own server. Um, so that's that's an option to just load the data, restore the database to your own server. Great, great. Uh, all right. Uh, last call for questions. Anyone else on the line that has any other questions, uh, please please type them in. Uh, we haven't gotten any additional questions. Um, okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess we've covered everything. Um, so, so just some of the follow-on items here. Um, so if you have any other questions, please feel free to email us either at our DGEN model account, dgen at nrel.gov, or any of our analysts' emails here. Uh, and if you want to learn more, uh, we have a, a model website. We have the model documentation, as well as a list of all the NREL publications that have used DGEN to date. Uh, I think we're at somewhere around 25 to 30 publications at this point. So uh, pretty pretty hefty library of, of model use cases. Um, and uh, we'll be holding more webinars and more outreach events going forward. Uh, we're hoping to uh, present at a, a few various conferences this year, uh, and we'll be holding a, a one-day training sometime later this year as well. Uh, so we'll be sending that out to anyone that's um, on our email mailing list. Um, so thank you so much for, for your time of your day, and um, uh, thanks. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.